to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God, Micah 6.8. As we go into our series this morning and our beginning of this series, Uncertainty, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and I thank you so much for gathering us together again in this way. Lord, as we go to your word, we proclaim that it is truth, and we proclaim that the good news of Jesus Christ transforms all things, and that we want to be good news people that embody the kingdom of God in our world. Lord, as we go to your word this morning, I would ask, as I do each and every week, that this would not be a time in the brief moments that we share where we just transfer information. But Lord, no, I actually pray that we would, we would uh, by the hearing of your word and by the power of your Holy Spirit, experience life transformation and that our hearts would be changed, encouraged, and formed and conformed to your image through this time of worship and through the hearing and preaching of your word. Holy Spirit, use me, speak through me. I can't do this alone. I want to do whatever you call me to do. So I am your vessel. Use me in this time. Give us ears to hear, hearts that are open, and hands and feet that will live this out, whatever we hear this morning, in our world this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, for the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about uncertainty. And how can we have certain faith in uncertain times? I just feel like as I was going through this past week and as before this, as I was praying through what God wanted us to do for this summer series as we begin summer, you know, one of the things I realized was that if pastors responded as into every single situation that's going on in the world right now, we would have to write three sermons a week probably because of how things change. And there's so much going on and there doesn't seem like that's going to end. And so we realize though that God has given us the opportunity to have his truth and to have his word, and that in his word and in our faith, we have certainties. We know things for certain, and those truths, those simple truths about our life can ground us and can form us and can inform us during this time, and I really felt like over these next eight weeks, we're just going to go through these basic, simple truths that God has given us as we move into the summer and as we stand firm for Jesus during this time. So we're going to be talking about how can I be certain that I'm saved? How can I be certain that God hears my prayers? How can I be certain that God promises me victory over my sins? How can I be certain about forgiveness? How can I be certain that God is guiding me in my life? How can I be certain that what I believe is true? How can I be certain of God's love and control over my life? Now, some of the sermons you're going to hear over this series aren't going to be new information. Now, for some of you, it will be new information, and praise God for that. I can't wait for you to hear these truths for the first time. But for most of us, and and certainly some of us, uh, these are going to be things that we already know, or we think we know. But what I believe is that this series is going to build faith in each and every one of us as we hear these simple truths of our faith, as we build into the certainty of our faith I believe they're going to strengthen our resolve and we are going to have a resolute beliefs and they're going to inform us as we live in this world of changing times. I believe most of all, if you already know these, I would ask actually that you would listen to these sermons and that they would be a means to equip you. Equip you to share these certain things, these certain truths with those that are in your spheres of influence. There's a lot of uncertainty, but we can have certain faith in uncertain times. You know, as I was thinking about certainty, I realized that one of the things I thought about was a time where my wife and I, Jessica, first bought this. Do you know what this is? I can't hear you, so I'm just going to tell you. This is a bike rack. It goes in the back of your car and your bikes go here and you can strap it on and uh, take your bikes wherever you need to go. It's a bike rack. And we got this years ago and I'll never forget the first time I put this on the car and I used the straps and I got it all secured and I put the bikes on and I strapped them in. I actually used bungee cords that weren't included just to make sure that the bikes weren't going anywhere and Jessica and I took off for a trip with our bikes and You know, as we were going down the road, um, it was an interesting thing because Jessica didn't believe that I knew what I was doing. She was uncertain that I did the right thing and that I actually put this bike rack on 
the car appropriately. She was uncertain that the bikes were going to stay where they needed to go. And so because of her uncertainty with the bike rack, every single turn on the road was accentuated. And every single start and stop was scary. And every, every bump that we hit and we heard the bike shift in the back, she'd look back and, and she'd be like, are they going to fall off? You know, she had no certainty about what her husband did with the bike rack. And I, just for the record, want you to know that I put it on correctly and the bikes didn't go anywhere, as if any of you had any, uh, any doubt about that. But that uncertainty really accentuated for her this idea that the, the, and, and, and that the, the bikes were not secure. And so when we went through the turns and when we hit the bumps and when we stopped, it all caused a level of stress, anxiety, and worry in her. And, and uh, even there was even times on the trip that I took that, that we took that I had to stop and I had stopped several times to check and make sure that things were secure. And so because of her uncertainty, it affected that journey. You know, in the journey of life, there's going to be uncertainty and we may experience, in fact, we will experience, we have experienced over these last few months, turns and twists and starts and stops and bumps along the journey. And we can respond with an anxiety or a worry at each and every different turn and every bump and every twist and turn. And and, and we can be uncertain about things or we can root our hearts and lives into the certainty of these simple truths that God has given us And we can go along the journey without worry. I believe that that's what this series is going to do. And so today we're going to talk about the first certain thing that I know that we can know. And that's the certainty that we are saved. The certainty of our salvation. Because it's really important that we have that certainty. You know, if there was a uh, Guinness Book World Record for the number of times that someone would say the sinner's prayer. I think I probably would be in there. I mean, as a, as a kid growing up, every time there was an invitation to, to pray that prayer or a hand to raise, you know, whether I raised my hand or not, each and every time there was an invitation to do that, uh, goodness gracious, I would pray that prayer. And I would pray that prayer over and over and over again. And I, and I would go to the altar over and over again. I wanted to be sure and I wanted to know that I know that I was saved, that I was good with Jesus, that I, that I had received salvation, that I was forgiven of my sins because it wasn't the kind of thing I wanted to be wrong about, right? So I would, I would do that over time, time and time again. And some of you may be that way. Some of you may not be certain. And this is something that I've realized through my years is that there's three different kinds of uncertainty, I think. One of these kinds of uncertainty are those that, you know, you don't know. Maybe you're here this morning and you really don't know. You don't know if you're saved. You don't know if you've really received salvation in Jesus Christ. You think to yourself, what does it mean to be saved? What is he even saying? What does it mean to be born again? Did I pray the prayer right? When I was, when I prayed the prayer with the pastor, did I pray it right? Or Was I sorry enough? Did I repent enough? Did I understand grace enough to really, truly be saved? That's one kind. There's another kind that says uh, that I would say the uncertainties uh, are the people that I would call the prayed the prayer crowd. Yeah, there's a misconception, I think, sometimes in Christianity that all you have to do is pray this prayer, and it's about praying the prayer rather than the heart behind praying the prayer. You know, 2011, George Barna, which is a Christian survey company, surveyed the United States and found that 50% of people in the United States responded that at one point in their life, they had prayed a prayer to receive Jesus in their heart. 50%. Out of that 50%, the same survey showed that 25% of those people that responded had no regular presence in church, were not part of a faith community. They, and when they answered questions about worldviews and behaviors that would align with a Christian worldview and a Christian values, only 50% of the 50% that said they prayed the prayer, so 25% of people that were polled, showed that they had values consistent with Scripture and God's Word. They prayed a prayer, but there was no fruit in their life. Another survey showed that 90% of Americans, 90% of Americans believe in heaven, but only 30% of Americans believe in hell. And almost none of us believe that they're going there. 
Almost none of us think that we are going to go to hell. And a lot of the reason for that is what the third, per, the third group of uncertainty, which is the good person crowd. If you ask someone, or maybe you've even said, well, of course I'm going to heaven. I'm a good person, right? I mean, most Western thought is surrounded by this idea that good people go to heaven. And everybody, pretty much everybody, thinks that, you know what, I'm a good person. Of course God wants me to go to heaven, right? It's this idea, well, I'm good. But my question is, the problem with this is, how good is good enough? I mean, what do you mean by good? How good do you have to be? Where's the line? You know, the Bible, the Quran, even the Book of Mormon, all of them are consistent that God does reward good behavior. So some people believe, and maybe you believe, you know what, if I'm good, and if I'm good enough, and if I do good works, yeah, I'll get into heaven, right? But here's the problem. If good people go to heaven, then we need a clear and consistent definition of what good is. What do we mean when we say we're good? And the problem is, is the idea of what is good changes. It changes from person to person. It changes over time. It changes over cultures. It changes over uh, ethnic groups. So what does it mean to be good? There's no clear indication that God has a scoring system for what is good in the Bible either. It's not like you can go through the Bible and you can see these commands and you know that if you get them 90% right, you're in, right? It's not in the Bible. In fact, the Bible doesn't claim in any way that there's a scoring system or that there's good enough things that you can do to go to heaven. On top of that, when Jesus was on earth in his ministry, Jesus in his ministry told the religious people that they weren't good enough And he told the criminals and the prostitutes that they were welcomed by God on the kingdom of heaven. So figure that one out. So how do you determine what is good? How do you know what is good? How can you have certainty if that's your way of knowing you're going to heaven? Now for those of us that are certain, that know that we're going to heaven, there's still a problem with this idea of being certain that we're saved. Because this is what I know will happen. And maybe you've experienced this. There's times where the wind or where the road turns and twists. There's times where life starts and stops. There's times where you have, you've hit button, you've hit bumps along the road, and Satan has a way to come in and whisper in your ear and cast doubt in your heart. So you really think you're safe from sins? You really think that God has forgiven you? You really think that Jesus' blood has washed away this? If you were really saved, you wouldn't do that. If you really were forgiven, if you really were a Christian, you would never think that. And seeds can be sown of doubt in your heart and in your life. And you begin to think because he begins to say it, though maybe not in a clear voice, in an internal voice. Surely that's not good enough. So how do we know? How can we be certain? You see, the reason why the Bible doesn't give a list of behaviors, doesn't give a checklist of how we know, and the reason why it never says that we just pray a prayer, right? It doesn't ever say that. And the reason why some of you don't know is because you you haven't yet heard what all 44 authors of Scripture understood, that mankind, all human beings, need a Savior a Messiah. We don't need a to-do list. We need someone who will save us from our sins, and we can be certain only in him. That brings us to our passage this morning in 1 John. 1 John 5, 11 to 13. In 1 John 5, 11 to 13, John writes about certainty. In fact, in my Bible, the heading for this passage of scripture says the certainty of God's testimony. This is what 1 John 5, 11 to 13 says. It says, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The one who has life, the one who has the Son has life. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. So let's look at this passage backwards. Because I think reading it backwards actually is going to give us a clear path of why we can know that we know that we're saved. 
In verse 13, it says, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. John tells us, John, a disciple of Jesus, John, the beloved disciple, John, the one who lived with Jesus and walked with Jesus for three years, John tells us that God wants us to know that we know, be absolutely certain that we have eternal life. He wants us to know that we've been not only saved from something, from our sins, from death, but we've been saved into something, into eternal life. We're going to talk about what that means in a little bit. We can know that we know. And he wants us to know for two very clear reasons. First of all, God wants us to know that we can have eternal life because he loves us. Because he, and, and here's the thing, when you love someone, you want them to know that you love them. And so God doesn't want it to be a secret. God doesn't want us to be uncertain. God doesn't want us to be tripped up in the turns and in the bumps along the journey of life. He wants us to know because he loves us. And the second reason is because the only way that we'll ever live and love for him and how he's called us to live and love him is to know for sure that he loves us. This certainty is so important. It's the foundation for all the things we'll talk about after this. You see, real love for God grows in the soil of certainty. And so God wants us to be sure about this. Sure, we can change and we can live differently and we can look like good people by by following a list of behaviors, by following a list of things that God's asked us to do. But here's the thing, a list of behaviors that will make us good will never truly do what God wants to do, which is change our heart. We may coerce someone to have better behavior. Maybe as a parent you've realized this. Maybe you can actually do enough damage or enough threatening to get somebody's, somebody's behavior to change and act the way that they think or they, sh- they believe that they should act. But God's not after that. He's after our heart and that we live and not only we live for him, but that we truly love him and are in relationship with him. And that real love that he's looking for grows in the soil of certainty. And so God wants us to know. John says, I've written all of these things so that you know that you have eternal life. This certainty seems like a big deal to John. John writes about it many times in in addition to 1 John 5. One of the places he writes about this is in the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, our fourth Gospel. There he tells us when Jesus is leaving, the night before he goes away from his disciples, he gives them some certain things about his love for them. He tells them that if you believe in me and you have faith in me, that you are my beloved children. You are sons and daughters of God. And in in John 14, 18, he tells them, I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to get you. God wants you to know that you can have eternal life, and he wants you to know that he loves you so much as his children that he's not going away forever. That he's not going to allow you to experience life and death and the destruction of this world that has fallen. No, he is going to come back for us because a good father wants his kids to know that he loves them and that he's coming back to them and he's not going to leave them, right? I mean, when I go away on a trip as a father, I don't go up to my kids and say, well, listen, I'm going away, but don't worry, daddy will be back soon. Or maybe I won't. Maybe I'm not your dad at all. Who knows? Good luck figuring that out, kids. See ya, right? Like, I would never do that. That's not what a loving father does. That is not what our God wants us to know. The creator of the universe wants you to know you're his child. He loves you. He's not left you as an orphan. He's coming to you. And in his love, he wants you to be certain not only that, but he also wants you to be certain that he loves you like a betrothed bride. You know, I know that the ladies sometimes get a little upset because the Bible says that when we're adopted in Jesus' family, we're adopted as sons. But, you know, us as men, we have to understand not only are we adopted as sons, but we are God's betrothed bride. Yeah, the church of Jesus Christ is actually God's bride. And he says, I'm coming back there as well. In John 14, the same discussion, he actually says... um, In John 14, the same discussion, he tells his disciples that I am going to prepare a place for you. 
And in the Jewish culture in the first century, that's what men did. They were betrothed to their bride, and then they would leave, and they would go, and they would build a house. And once the house was ready, they'd get all their friends, and they'd go and get their bride, and they would get married. And so Jesus is saying, not only do I love you, and I'm not going to leave you as orphans, as children of God, but also that you're my betrothed bride, and I'm going to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be also, is how he finishes that section of scripture, because God wants us to know that he loves us. Listen, when my wife and I got engaged, Jessica was in Lancaster at the Lancaster College of uh, Nursing, and I was a police officer down in the metro D.C. region. And so we were in a long-distance relationship. And so uh, when I came home uh, to Elizabethtown, where she was living with her parents while she was at uh, the College of Nursing, uh, I would see her. And when I would see her on those long-distance weekends when we would finally rejoin together, I would make sure that she knew that I loved her. And I would make sure that she knew next time I had an opportunity to come home that I would come back to Elizabethtown to be with her again. And that one day after we were married, we would start our life together. And we bought a home and, found a, and had a home in Maryland after, after we were engaged and married. And so we knew that that was going to happen. And I wanted her to know how much I loved her. I loved her so much that I gave her a big fat diamond ring so that she knew. And so that other men who may be attracted to her and want to steal her away would know that she's mine and she's my betrothed and I'm coming back to her. And of course, I knew that if I did not come back, that she would keep the big diamond ring and I would be out of a lot of money, right? But that's, but the, that's, that's besides the point. The point is, she knew that I loved her, and God wants us to know that too. Because God knows that rather than behavior modification, rather than a list of good works, rather than this idea that you have to be good enough, God knows that certainty in the good news of Jesus Christ, that his love has come in the form of Jesus Christ, and that Jesus has given you a way to be certain that you will be saved, that that love has a greater power to produce love in our hearts and produce fruit of living for him in our lives, greater than a list of good enough will ever do. And he wants us to know that we know that we know because our love for God grows only in the soil of our certainty. And so how can we have this certainty? John tells us in 1 John 5, 12, he says, the one who has the son has life. It's you and me. If you have the son, you have life. The one who does not have the son of God does not have life. He makes it very clear. I want you to know that you have eternal life, and the one who has the Son has life, and the one who does not have the Son does not have life. You must then receive it or reject it. How do I know I'm saved? You either receive it or you reject it. And what do you have to reject? The Son. And more so, you have to either receive or re- by acceptance or rejection what the Son, Jesus, did for you and for me and for all of humanity. First Peter tells us there's a lot of scripture this morning, and I believe it's because scripture can tell you better than I can. There's a lot of scripture about why we know that we know. First Peter tells us what Jesus did. Peter says Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. Once for all. Once for all. Jesus suffered for your sins and my sins. All of the things, all of the the inclinations that we have, all of the times that we break relationship with each other, all of the times that we act out of our own human needs, all of the times that we treat people poorly, all of the times that we violate violate God's laws, all the times that we do things that are against his law, all of the times that we do things that we're guilty about, all of the sins that we have made, Jesus came once for all. His death was once for all. But we have to receive it. We have to put faith in that in order to be saved. In John 1 12, John writes, but to him, but to all who receive him, there it is again, he gave them the right to be children of God to those who believe in his name. You see, the one who has the Son has life, but that requires that you believe that he died for your sins once for all, and you have to receive him. In order to know that he loves you as a child, you have to believe in his name and what he's accomplished. 
And Romans 5, 8 is very clear about what he accomplished when he says, God showed his great love for us. That's you and for me. That's for the entire world. By sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. You see, the only way you can have certainty that you'll be saved is begin by admitting to yourself that you know that you're a sinner. And not only are you a sinner, but you're someone in need of being saved. And God showed his love for you and for me by sending Jesus Christ to die for you and to pay the penalty for your sin and make a way for you to enter into life forever while you were still sinners. Because this is what God knew. We have to understand this. God knew that if you and I were left to our own devices, if you and I just lived out life without him interceding on our behalf, that you and I living and trusting in our own feelings and our own thoughts and in our own flesh and in our own ways of operating in the world, that you and I would be on a one-way trip and it would lead to our own destruction and that you and I would eventually break every relationship that we have. You and I would eventually separate ourselves so far from God that we would be lost and that we would, we, we would be unrescuable. And so Jesus came. God sent his only son to come to this world as the rescuer. And he came and he stand, stood in our place and he took every single one of our one-way reckless train on the way to its own destruction accident waiting to happen selves. And he took it all upon himself on a cross at Calvary. And he died for you you and for me while we were still sinners. And the promise is that God will receive you wherever you are and he will take you however you come. He doesn't expect you to be a good person. He expects you to be a sinner who knows that he needs saving. And if you would just receive that and if you would just come to him, he promises that he will save you from that. But not only that, he won't leave you there. He will come into you and he will transform you by the power of his spirit. And though you or you begin as a sinner, he will change you from the inside out to become more like him until your life looks more like him in a progressive way for the rest of your life on this earth. And then he will glorify you in a, in a time when he returns until you will be like him and you will be with him forever and ever. That is what Jesus did. Implicit of all of this, folks, is listen, We cannot have life as he has created us to have on our own. We can't. Without him is death. Isaiah 59, 2 is very clear. It's your sins and my sins that have cut us off from God. Without Jesus, there is a great chasm between us and God. No good work could ever cross that chasm. Nothing we could ever do, nothing we could ever work for, nothing we could ever work up in our lives would ever cross that chasm. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of that sin, the repayment of that chasm is death. That's what you and I have to look forward to unless Jesus steps in. But if you have the Son, something happens. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, Jesus came and he closed that chasm with his cross so that all that would receive him would know that they have life. God did what we can't. Ephesians 2.8 tells us that we are saved by our by grace, through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is God's gift. You can't do it on your own. We are saved by grace. Jesus, we don't need to think about Spider-Man or Superman or Batman. Jesus came as our rescuer, as a superhuman. God and man in one, and he saved us, and it was God's gift, but you have to receive it. Human efforts can't restore your relationship with God fully. 
The only way you can be saved, the Greek word sozo, the only way you can be cured, the only way you can live a life where the, the, with sin that makes you sick and die it would no longer happen, but you would be healthy forever. The only way that your relationship with God can be restored, the only way you can have certainty about your salvation is if you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone and what he did. And the promise is that if you receive the Son, you will have life. That's what John says in 1 John 5, 11. He says, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. You see, the source of life, real life, isn't a belief system. It's not. It's not a checkbox of right and wrong and how good can I be. It's not life isn't how much money I can make, how many cars I can have, how many clothes that I can have, how much success that I can have, how many initials I can have in front or after my name, how many friends that I have, how, how, how much that I accumulate on my own self-worth. It's not even about self-actualization or self-help, anything to do with self. The promise about being certain about about being saved also is a promise that if you want to experience life, that is what you're being saved into, real life, the life God created for you to have, life that God created you to live with him, the only way you can experience that eternal life is not in anything else but one thing, a person. That life is in the Son, and his name is Jesus Christ. It is a brand new life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, who, um, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, whoever is in Christ, who has received Christ, who has been brought into him, they are a new creation. The old is gone, behold, the new has come. In Christ Jesus, because of his death for your sins and the sins of the world, and then his resurrection from the grave three days later, all who believe in him are brought into that new creation that Jesus Christ inaugurated by his resurrection. That new creation that one day when he returns will be made, all things are new. And you and I have the opportunity not only to live into the promise that when he returns, we will live in life and we will live in a world as it should be with no sickness, with no pain, with no racism, with no problems, with no sin at all. Not only will we do that, but you and I have the opportunity now in our lives to be saved into real life, life as it is meant to be, life as he wants us to live in him and experience life, abundant life, John 10.10 10 says, in his name. And we can be certain of our salvation in his name and from that place, we can live the life that God has gifted to each, of our, each and every one of us. It's eternal life. And he wants us to know that we know that we know that how you have that is you put your faith in his son. And if you do not receive the Son, you will not have life. But God has given life to the world, and life is in his, in, in his name. And eternal life starts now. Life starts the day you say yes to Jesus, not the day that you die. And John says, I want you to know this. God wants you to know this. And if you know it, then you have a testimony. 1 John 5, 11, he says, this is the testimony. This is the story. This is the song praising him all day long. That death was arrested and my life began. That love came down and rescued me. We sang all of those songs this morning for a reason. Because this is the words upon our lips. This is the truth upon our hearts. This is the life that we live. And as we embody it in the world, we live from a place of certainty. We live from a place that we know, that we know, that we know that every twist and turn, every start and stop, every bump along the way in the journey of life will happen, but God will never leave us. He's promised us that he will never leave us, that he will come back for us, that we are betrothed to him, and he is preparing a place that we will be with him forever, and that right now we can live in life the way that he intended it to be, and he wants us to know that because real love for him grows out of that soil of certainty and everything we talk about for the next eight weeks is built upon 
this truth. You can know for certain if you put your faith and you put your trust in what Jesus did. You could walk along in the journey of life certain of God's love and the victory you have in his name regardless of what's happening out in the externals. When life isn't as it should be, you can know that it won't be this way forever. Not because you prayed a prayer. Not because you're good enough. But because you know Jesus. And you put your faith and your trust in him alone. Romans 10. Romans 10, 9 says this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you have that certainty this morning? God wants you to have it. And the gospel is that it's a gift to you if you receive it today. So I ask you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the certainty that we can have in your name. We praise you this morning. We lift up your name. Lord, for those watching right now, if any of them don't have certainty in Jesus, if that's you right now as you're watching on this screen, whether it's live this morning or whether you're watching this recorded, whether it's maybe somebody sent this to you, you can have certainty because of what Jesus has done for you. The Son of God came to earth. He lived a perfect life. He died a death for the sins of the world, for every brokenness, everything that's wrong, everything you've ever experienced, where you felt in yourself that I shouldn't act this way or you thought about life that it shouldn't be this way. All of the sins, everything that's violated what God has set out to be his law, all of the brokenness, all of the darkness in your life, Jesus came and on one day he, while you were still still a sinner, one day before you even existed, He took it all on himself 2,000 years ago. And the three days later, he rose from the dead, proving that sin had been defeated, and so had death. And if you would just believe in that, that from that day on, God raised him up and seated him at his right hand, and he is Lord and King of the world. And you would believe that that is who Jesus is, that he is Lord. And if you would believe that God raised him from the dead, and you would believe that his life, his ministry, his death and resurrection is truth, and that you receive now, that your belief in that also makes you a child of God, a co-heir with Christ, and that you now can live a life in certainty. If you say yes to that today, all you have to say is, Heavenly Father, Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I admit that I am a sinner. I admit that I can't do this on my own. Heavenly Father, I need a Savior. And so today I put my trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of my sins. God, I am not my own. I've been, pot, I've been bought with a price. And I put my trust in the blood of Jesus. Come into my life. Renew my heart and mind so that I can live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time today, I invite you to go to palmyragrace.org slash I was here. palmyragrace.org slash I was here. And let us know that you prayed that prayer for the first time and that you have taken a step to move into certainty that you are saved so that we can walk with you in your discipleship. Whether you hear it this morning for the first time, 
whether you watch this YouTube video 10 years from now, reach out to us because I want to walk with you in your next steps. Our love for God grows in the soil of certainty and you can know that you know that God loves you, that he came to die for you, and that you can have real life in his name. Thanks for joining us this morning. Please go to I Was Here if you have any prayer requests. Let us know you were here. God bless you. Come back next week and join us again as we continue week two of uncertainty, certain faith in uncertain times. Have a good afternoon.